So, about seven years ago, I had an online date who, after I told him a second date wouldn't be happening, decided to show up at my place of work. Needless to say, after that, I was extremely hesitant to dive back into the pool of online dating. In fact, since then, I can count on one hand the number of men I've dated from online. But my sister and my best friend have both met men over the last year on an app that connects through Facebook. It's used to help filter out catfishes and also tries to find mutual friends of friends that would match with what you're looking for in a partner. So, over the last month, I've been talking to guys here and there, but hadn't yet really found one I was ready to move beyond text with. Then this guy came along. We chatted in the app, and he was really nice and seemed safe. After almost three weeks of daily texting, I agreed to a date. For the first time ever, I did not stalk his social media profiles because I wanted to stop self-sabotaging. I tend to dig so deep that I know too much before the date and have already made my decision that there will be no second date. Yes, I am extremely paranoid. So I show up for the first date and it's okay. He's mostly quiet and kind of shy, but polite. I know I have a big personality and can dominate the conversation, so I decide to give him a second shot. As the week leading up to date two goes on, I start to get apprehensive and tell myself not to sabotage this. I realize because I didn't want to stalk his profiles, I didn't know his last name, so I text him and ask. He seems hesitant to tell me. He asks me why I need to know. So I respond jokingly that I typically ask before the first date so I can know who my murderer is. But we're beyond that now, and I simply want to know who I'm dating. It takes him a while to respond, but he sends it finally, and then doesn't text again for a while. I keep my promise to myself and don't social media stalk him. I tell some friends who start to seem hesitant about me meeting him again. Date 2 I show up at the restaurant, my choice, and it's pretty empty so there's plenty of parking right up front. I park and wait. I see another car pull in, assuming it's him. He drives past all the open spots, my car included, which he knows because he walked me to it after date one. He parks over at the side of the building, gets out, walks past my car, and texts me he saw me in the lot. It seemed a little awkward but I ignored it. We enjoy the date and spend an hour and a half talking on and off until the restaurant closes. We discussed where in the city we live and the fact that we lived in those areas our entire lives. We also discuss social media and he claims he has no social media account. This should have been a red flag since the app takes Facebook. Although the conversation was much better, I wasn't sure that I was ready to tell him I wanted to see him again. So I figured I would go home and think about it. He walks me to my car, but walks uncomfortably close behind me. I ignore this and turn to awkwardly hug him and say my goodbye. I don't open the car until he's walked away after a bit of a pause. I leave and get out on the road to head home. There aren't many cars in that area, as it's a heavily restaurant-laden area, and most are closing for the night. I get up to the main road I'd need to turn down to go the direction I live and notice the car behind me gets into the turn lane. I was not going home because I actually wanted to make a quick stop at the grocery store to grab some items I needed for dinner the following night. The lights turn red and they sit extremely far back. I look in my mirror and realize it's him. No big deal. I'm sure it was just a coincidence that he was going this way, as there are other stores this way as well. I refuse to become paranoid and overthink things, so I get up to the intersection the store is at and note he's still in the far lane, so I hop into the left-hand turn lane to get to the store and notice he cuts over two lanes to get behind me. That seemed a bit odd, but maybe he didn't know where the entrance to this shopping center was. Still a really odd coincidence he'd be coming this way, especially without sending a text or something acknowledging he's behind me. I mean, we're the only cars on the road. I pull into the store and note he pulls in one row before I do. 
I decide to loop around the lot and pull back out onto the service road. I slowly drive back to the main road, noticing he gets out of his car and scans the parking lot. Not a casual scan like, is there a better parking spot, but a prolonged, where are you scan. I get back out onto the road and drive all the way to another out-of-the-way grocery store that I actually used to work at. Knowing it's a safe place that will be on a more heavily populated end of town with some friends who will be there to make me feel safe. Needless to say, I haven't heard from him since and I think he knows I know. It took me a while, but I found his social media. His first name was not what he told me. I dug through my texts with him until I found a screenshot he'd sent me of an Instagram page which listed mutual followers. Another red flag I should have remembered, he obviously had an Instagram. I start digging through the accounts listed until I find one that's not private and find his profile. This leads to the ability to reverse Google image until I find his Facebook, which has a different first name and city that is nowhere near where he claimed he lived. Time to delete my dating profile again. My ex and I lived in a brand new subdivision. It was two houses, an unfinished house and vacant lots. One area was far from our house and nearly in the woods. Late one night, maybe two or so in the morning, the doorbell rings and rings and rings. Finally, getting annoyed and worried about a newborn waking up, my ex and I answer the door. There's a couple, a man and a woman standing there. They say they broke down and need some help. They're all the way in the back lot. My ex is not the smartest guy, but also an auto mechanic, so he decides to help them. I tell him it seems weird. He doesn't listen, so I do the next best thing and tell him I'll drive over, leaving the baby in the house. I wait in the truck while he checks it out. They keep insisting he get under the car, under the dashboard, all sorts of weird stuff that would make him prone and easily attacked. My ex keeps telling them he can't because he's huge. He's nearly 7 foot tall and 350 pounds. He simply doesn't fit. So he comes back to me and now says it seems weird. He finds nothing wrong. He gets in the truck and we call 911 and tell them we're calling a wrecker. We see the two people go off running in the woods and so we lock ourselves in our house until the cops show up. The cops check out the scene find the people not hiding well due to serious amounts of drugs they're on and realize the car is stolen. I'm positive they would have brained my ex given the chance and robbed the house. So, 2am drug heads, please stay in prison. Let's never meet again. To give some context, I've been homeless with my mom and her emotional support animal for the last few months. When we first became homeless, it was in my first year of college. Where I live, college is free for the first two years, and my college, after I gave them an explanation, gave me and my mom a hotel room for a few weeks. The hotel room was fine, nothing special, but was probably better than most, considering like it was $170 per night. About two days into our stay, we went downstairs to do laundry, but the washers in the hotel were too expensive for us, so I texted my mom and was waiting by it for her to pull up in the car so we could go to a laundromat instead. While I was waiting, I was on my phone, so I didn't notice my mom pull up and she yelled to me to hurry up and get in the car. I grabbed the dogs and my clothes. I noticed she was talking to the man two doors down from our room. Our room was on the second floor, so I thought it was weird that she started a conversation from the car to someone upstairs. So when I got in the car, I asked her about it. She proceeded to tell me after she yelled at me to hurry up. He'd responded to her that he'd be down in a minute. 
so she was explaining to him that she was talking to me. We both thought it was weird that he responded like that to her, but I brushed it off that maybe he was waiting for someone from Uber or something. That was until we got back to see his door slightly open and him staring out of it with just his face peeking. I tried to brush it off again because I thought maybe he was still waiting for an Uber or Lyft or something because he had everything in his room turned off and it was still quite cold out being in the beginning of spring. I would see this man staring out of his room with all of his lights off periodically about half the time I left or was coming back to the room. My mom, who was a heavy smoker, would get scared by the man staring at her and would come back inside the room early. So throughout our stay, we tried our best to avoid the man if we could. If he opened his door, we went back inside. If we went outside or got back from somewhere and he was staring, we'd avoid eye contact. A little later that night, I went out to the car for something and saw a couple sitting on the stairs talking about something, but I didn't think much of it. Later that night, it was probably about three in the morning, I was gaming with my friends and my mom was up watching TV. We're both night owls, when all of a sudden our dog started barking at the door. We thought this was weird since she never just barked randomly at the door. She only really barked when she wanted the food we were eating or she wanted to play. I grabbed her and put her on my lap, petting her while I played to calm her down. Her barking at the door became something she did often during our stay there, and it was almost exclusively at night, between the hours of 2am and 7am. We didn't figure out what she was barking about until the end of our stay at the hotel. Our last day there, we saw that couple moving out of their room. It turns out they were next to us, and my mom got talking with them while I was putting our stuff in the car. It turns out the couple were moving rooms because the man from two doors down was harassing the couple, knocking on their doors and singing to the woman through the door late at night. Our dog was more than likely barking at the man whenever he approached our room. As one night we were awoken, by what sounded like a knock before our dog started barking, but by the time I checked the door, there was no one there. He was probably trying to do a similar thing to us, and with him staring out at the door, he was more than likely mentally unwell. And while I hope he gets the help he needs, I also hope he didn't do something potentially harmful to anyone else who ended up in the rooms next to him. I was 18, freshly out of high school and got a job at a newly opened pizza place. The crew were all younger kids around my age. I quickly befriended another girl working there, but there was a guy, maybe a year or two older than me, who just gave me the weirdest vibes. I just felt uncomfortable being around him. He didn't really do anything outright strange. He hit on me and kept asking for my number, but I had a boyfriend and kept turning this guy down. He was never rude about it or anything, so I had no real reason to feel that anything was off about him, but I did. Sometimes while I was working, I'd feel like someone was staring at me, and I'd turn around and he'd be watching me from the other side of the kitchen. I remember telling the girl I had befriended that I just felt something was off about that guy, and he made my skin crawl. Another co-worker, who'd gone to school with the guy, overheard the conversation and told me that he understood. His friend could be intense and off-putting, but he was mostly harmless. The other girl and I just kind of tried to laugh it off, but she agreed that something just didn't feel right. I always worked the late shift so I could start after my college classes and I worked until close. One night, the creepy guy got off of work maybe an hour or two before close, and I was scheduled that night. So he leaves at his scheduled time, and I work until close, and then go to leave and walk to my car. It was around 1am at this time, and really dark. As I'm walking to my car, I notice someone else in the parking lot. It was the creepy guy, and he was just 
standing there, watching me. His car was still there, so he wasn't waiting for a ride. He had just waited for me to leave. I got in my car and felt incredibly weirded out by the entire thing, so I left, went home to my apartment, told my partner what had happened, and then sent a text to my manager and said I was sorry, but the creepy guy was making me uncomfortable to the point that I couldn't work there anymore, and that had been my last night. I never went back. About a month later, I see on the news that the creepy guy from the pizza place had followed the other girl from work, the one I'd been friends with, one night after a closing shift. He had waited outside her house in the dark, broke in when everyone was asleep, murdered her dad, and held her hostage and assaulted her for hours while the police and SWAT team tried to get him out of the house. I still think about her a lot, and at the time... I felt genuinely guilty about what had happened to her, as if I could have done something to prevent it. I'm from Northern California, and I've spent a lot of time backpacking and primitive camping in various parks throughout the region. I've never been a big fan of car camping simply because people are trouble, and I aim to avoid them in nature. This incident further solidified my original feelings and has prevented me from doing any camping at more populated sites since. A couple years back, two of my girlfriends and I decided on a whim to head north and camp alongside the Yuba River. We had a decent day swimming and sunning ourselves on the rocks before we headed back to camp to cook dinner. All in all, a lovely day. We were all sleeping in separate tents, and I should mention that one of my friends is a heavy, heavy sleeper, and the other had a fair amount to drink and was out cold. Around 2am, I woke suddenly. I was disoriented, and it took me a moment to realize the sounds I was hearing was a woman in distress. She was desperately pleading with someone. Her cries became hysterical screams, and it quickly became evident that she was being beaten. Without thinking, I exited my tent and attempted to wake my girlfriends. I was panicked and frightened, and my instinct was to avoid making too much noise. I was unable to stir either of them. I felt like I was virtually useless and would likely get myself injured or worse if I were to intervene, but I couldn't sit idly by while someone was being hurt. I grabbed my buck knife, and with the moon high overhead, I cautiously crept toward the commotion. As I faltered toward the clearing of their campsite, suddenly to my left I heard loud footsteps and a man emerged from the woods. He gestured for me to keep quiet and his confident and frankly pissed demeanor and gait put me instantly at ease. I could hear a kerfuffle, and shortly after, the man emerged with a woman, a young boy, and two chihuahuas. She was overwrought, and didn't want to be near the man who'd come to her aid, and insisted she only wanted to speak with me. She told me they were in between housing, and that this was an isolated incident. The abuse had clearly been prolonged and frequent, considering she had old bruises and injuries all over her body. I recognize now that I could have handled what would have been the remainder of the night in a smarter and safer way, but live and learn, I guess. There was no cell service, and she didn't want to leave the campground. I offered my tent to her and her son, and slept in my truck. By the morning light, she was gone. I felt completely deflated and depressed. What was supposed to be a light-hearted getaway had turned heavy and bleak. I made coffee for my campmates and we discussed the events of the night and decided we just wanted to go home. We packed up and I thought to brush my teeth before hitting the road. I'm going to town when all of a sudden this absolute ghoul of a man begins trudging up the hill toward me. He's tall and scrawny prematurely balding and looks clammy as hell. He was screaming, fucking bitch this and that, and it's readily apparent that this is the culprit from the previous evening. 
He begins frantically scanning the forest floor and picks up a large rock while honing it on me. Instead of feeling afraid now, I'm livid. I happen to be a DV survivor, and even if this weren't the case, this slimy piece of trash was threatening me. With toothpaste foaming at my mouth, I shout back that he's a coward, but I guess he thinks he's a big man because he's not afraid to hit a woman. I like to think I looked rabid. Long story short, another man bursts through the trees and clotheslined the loser. So yeah, I'm not really afraid of wildlife, just us humans. I have been hiking at a wooded trail near my house for about three years now, and it's my favorite trail due to the beautiful waterfalls and meadows, but I'd had several creepy encounters over the years. Luckily I always hike with my 90 pound Bernice, Baker, he's the sweetest boy, but will protect me. The first encounter was three years ago in the winter, when I was walking up a hill and Baker started growling unlike I've ever heard. I look around and realize there's a man in the shadow of the woods watching us, and when I notice him, he starts slowly walking towards us with his head covered. I said hello as usual, and he didn't respond. I kept walking and got a feeling that I should turn back. When I did, I realized he turned around on the trail, but once he saw me, he walked into the woods and stared out at the valley hugging a tree. So nothing too crazy, but it just felt off. Around the same time a year later, Baker and I are walking on the same trail, and again, Baker starts growling. I realize there appears to be the same man standing off in the shadows watching us, but I figured maybe Baker just scared him so he was standing away from us, waiting to cross the bridge. We cross the bridge and keep walking. I again get that feeling that I should turn around. When I do, I realize he's behind us, so he had no reason to be waiting for us to cross the bridge. I sit down with Baker at my side and pull out my phone while making it clear I've seen him. He stops when I turn around, but continues walking after I pull out my phone. I start walking back and find a large stick he had left. It had been sharpened with a knife into a spear. I take the spear and continue walking while looking around me the entire time. I now know I should have reported it at this point, but I just convinced myself I was being paranoid. About a year later in the winter, I'm walking along the same path. It's snowing with the trails mostly empty, and I suddenly see a bunch of trees with frowning faces made out of snow despite not seeing anyone on the trail for miles. Baker again starts growling at something in the woods that I cannot see, so we turn around. I don't report it, because I figured it would never be taken seriously. Then today, a few months later, I'm walking along the trail and find a tree with I see you, written in chalk. I immediately get a weird feeling and turn back and report it to the park rangers and police. For the first update, I'm working with park rangers to keep an eye out. After sharing in my hiking groups on Facebook, several women have come forward with similar experiences at the same place. A second update, six different women have come forward with similar experiences, with a similar looking man at the same park. They've all reported it to the rangers. I interviewed with the local news, and it's everywhere. Rangers are not happy with me for sharing it with the public, but that's fine with me as everyone has a right to know. Someone wiped off the I see you message before the news team could see it. Four separate women messaged me thinking it was the exact same guy, despite the women not knowing each other. They stated he's unstable and spends most days at this park. His cousin reported him too. I shared his name and photos with the rangers, and apparently the suspect is an old park ranger himself. So, we shall see. Oh, and the suspect apparently loves climbing trees, and has a bunch of photos of himself 50 feet in the air, 
so he's probably up in the trees, watching. And for the final update, apparently he has a secret spot in these woods where he has a chainsaw and gasoline. We reported it to the rangers. I'm pretty sure having a secret campground in a public place is illegal, and stalking and intimidation is a form of illegal assault, so there's no reason he can't at least be questioned. It was July 2008. We just installed high-speed internet had an impressive 5 megabits per second. Harry Potter 6 was deferred another year. Justin Bieber was about to make his big break with One Time. And I, thousands of miles away, was living life in rural western Canada. The town I lived in could not even be called that. It was a settlement of perhaps two dozen acreages clustered together near a lake and boasted just an elementary school with grades kindergarten through grade 5 and no stores. On this particular day, I was at that school playground alone, swinging and pondering life. None of my friends were around, but the solitude never bothered me. I was perfectly content, swinging and pondering life and daydreaming as I often did. That is when I noticed the van behind me. It was your classic creeper van. Older, large and boxy, white, generic van. And what struck me as odd was how slow the van was driving. It could not have been driving faster than 10 kilometers per hour. Still swinging, I craned my neck and watched this van slowly creep along and then out of my line of sight. I thought that was the end of it when, a few minutes later, along comes the van again, even slower, and this time driving on the road in front of the park. I watched the van creep along, turn left and out of sight, and back behind me it came creeping along again, ever slow and present. As I watched it disappear for the second time, I recalled an incident that took place just two months prior. In the nearby town where I was attending school, a few kids in the grade below mine had been approached by a man as they walked home from school, who offered them candy. He had allegedly been driving a white van. School officials had urged us to stay very vigilant. I began to run across the field, determined to beat the van to that road. Don't panic, I told myself. It's probably not the same guy. And that's when the idea hit me. Oh, the idiotic, dangerously foolish idea hit me. I was going to hide myself in a nearby bush and as the van crept by, I would obtain its license plate and give it to the police. It would be too easy. Twelve-year-old self, what were you thinking? I wasn't thinking, because I did just that. I hid in the bushes, and I waited, and waited. I waited to no avail. And as I waited, the logical part of my brain kicked in. This was an extremely lonely, well-concealed spot of land. Maybe, just maybe, trying to obtain this license plate was not a smart idea. I suddenly wanted very much not to be in that isolated bush. Abandoning my attempts at being Nancy Drew, I began the journey home with a sense of urgency. As I walked along the road, a dirt pavement, I took in my surroundings and saw no van. Perhaps it had left the area, I thought, hopefully. I turned right, away from the school and playground, and began to walk towards my house. Safety laid just beyond the hairpin turn of a road that I was jaunting along. A loud screeching of tires came into my ear canal. I turned slightly and saw it, the white fan. Where it came from, I did not know. What I did know was that I was extremely isolated and that it was speeding towards me. This is when the lizard brain took over. I no longer thought. I ran. I was no longer a whole being. My sole purpose was to run. 
I can still feel my sweaty feet sliding around my sandals, still see my pink skirt frantically trying to keep up with me, still hear those squealing tires. I flung myself down the hill, at the foot of it lay my house, my lifeline. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the van for the last time. It was haphazardly turning left and away from me. The next thing I knew, I was standing at the family deep freeze, a red freezy in my hand. Vaguely, I heard a faint voice, miles away. I was breathing heavily, hyperventilating really. What happened? What happened? My dad's face was as white as a ghost. A hardened man. He looked truly afraid. I spat out the story and burst into tears. My dad hugged me. You're safe with daddy, he assured me. Then he left, determined to find this van. As he was gone, I ran throughout the house, locking the doors. When my dad returned, he told me he'd seen no van. It had disappeared into the afternoon sun. My dad phoned the police anyway, and he stressed the similarities between what happened to me to the reports of what happened to my schoolmates. Unfortunately, the police never came to talk to me. I don't think they really cared. I stayed in the house for the next few days, afraid to venture out. As the days wore on, I regained my confidence to return to the park and life went on. I never did see that van again. I still shudder to think about what may have happened all those years ago if I had let that van catch up to me. For a bit of background, when my wife was young, her parents and siblings lived with one set of her grandparents. Her grandfather was murdered in the home. It happened in his bedroom upstairs. The room was used primarily as storage for the next 20 plus years. Her parents tried to sell the house multiple times, but living in a small town, everyone knew and the house would not sell, so they stayed. Years later, and while my wife and I were engaged, there was a murder trial which I attended in support of her family. I saw the crime scene photos. A few years later, we had two kids. The oldest was six at the time. My wife's family does not talk about the murder, and our kids do not know about the murder to this day. My father-in-law decided he wanted the room where the murder happened to be a hangout room for the grandkids when the family was in town. He put sleeping bags and a TV in the room ahead of a holiday days long together. We didn't like it but stayed silent since the murder was a sore subject. My father-in-law wanted all the grandkids to all sleep in there together. We were the first to arrive, and my son went into the room alone. He usually couldn't sit still long at that age, so after a couple of hours, I decided to check on him. Here's how our conversation went. During the whole conversation, he was still and rigid and would not look away from the TV. Hey buddy, is everything okay up here? Yeah. Okay. Have fun. Daddy. Do I have to sleep in here? I don't want to. Why not? I'm not alone. Every hair on my body stood up. Well, yeah. I'm here with you, buddy. No. There's something in here with us. Are they nice? Me? A grown-up? A kid? A grown-up? What are they doing now? They're watching you. You've never said anything like this at your grandparents' house before, and you've been here a lot. They don't leave this room, and I've never been in here before. Where are they now? Without looking away from the TV, he points to the far corner where his great-grandfather was murdered and said, They're standing over there. They don't move much. Okay, buddy, you don't have to stay in here. And he left the room with me.
So I met up with a guy who was coming on too strong and kept pressuring I meet him in a secluded park before our movie date. I told him if we met at a park, it had to be one of my choice, which he agreed to. We met. He looked like his picture, just way slimmer and sickly. As we walked, he suggested walking down a dark path, which I disagreed with. Then he suggested we go catch our movie. I went to my car and was going to meet him there, and this guy literally ran away and drove off. I was shocked and left, and realized he blocked me off of everything. Then I started to realize how strange things were. I told my friend, and she used her amazing research skills and found this guy's name, which he was completely lying about. Well, guess what? She got on Tinder and eventually matched with him, and the things he was saying were uncanny. First of all, he was lying about simple things, using exact phrases he used on me, like if I was clean and whatnot. Then he also tries to meet my friend at a park, which is really secluded. What throws me off was his defensive comments about sex when it came up in conversation, and how as soon as it was brought up, he talked non-stop. He also kept telling me to wear a skirt, and all black. He talked about my clothes a lot for those three days we spoke, and really wanted details in what I was going to wear. He was a conventionally handsome guy who should have no trouble getting women, but I don't know. Something just rubbed me wrong. His talk about sex makes me think he wanted to spread something, and he met me just to see if I was a good candidate. For clarification, I did not wear what he insisted I wear. I did not tell my friend to meet him. She matched with him while I was literally still parked in my car, explaining everything that happened. I did not meet him at the park he wanted me to. I met him at a very busy public park. I believe the STD thing because he kept talking about sex, asking if I had anything, wanting to know my history, and looked very sickly. In his pictures, he was muscular. In person, he had sunken eyes and was very thin, which reminded me of people with untreated HIV I see at work often. I know I was dumb. I have bipolar and mania does blind my judgment and I was not thinking clearly. I just wanted a thrill and had this urge just to feel something. It's not okay, and I agree. This was a few years ago in my old house, around Halloween. One day, I was home alone in my house. I have a wife, three kids, and a dog. I'm in my basement cutting wood and working, when all of a sudden I hear thumping on the ceiling above me. It's rhythmic and almost perfectly in beat. I'm a handyman and do a lot of my own fixing and know the usual sounds houses make. This was not usual. I start to follow the thumping around the first floor. It's as if someone is walking around. I call out my wife's name. No answer. My kids. No answer. Just soft moaning with the thumps. My dog is with me in the basement and following the sound with me with his tail straight up, completely silent. This was weird because I have a loud, jumpy dog. I then slowly follow the thumping to the steps, and I hear a weak, old woman's voice calling for Jimmy over and over. Ignoring my hellos, she keeps walking around my first floor, calling out, moaning, and thumping. I grab my dog by the collar and leave through the basement door, and I walk around the outside of my house. I go up the street, and there's a younger couple calling out for someone. They're calling out for someone called Nancy. I go up to them and say, Are you Jimmy? The guy looks at me, and simultaneous relief and confusion crossed his face. He tells me that's his dad's name, but he passed years ago. It turns out, Nancy was his mom with some kind of mental issues. 
she snuck out of their house up the road. Her family lived in my house before we did, and she was having some kind of episode. She went looking for her husband in her home. Oh, she also has a wooden leg. I don't know the story, but that was the thumping. We got her home safely, and I also double-locked the doors from that point on. Almost a year ago, I was an opener at a resort, clocking in before 5am each day. The resort is located inside an affluent neighborhood in a very wealthy town slash suburb. Employees had to park in one of two parking lots at either end of the property, and the lot I chose was adjacent to a long and windy road outside the resort, which led to the rest of the neighborhood. The road and resort were separated by a short range of brush and trees that no one ever walked through. I'd arrive one morning, per usual, and put the car into park with my headlights still on. The lights in the lot weren't ever on in the morning since no one else really showed up before 6am when the sun was out, so it was usually always dark at the start of my walk. Save for security, I was one of the first employees to arrive on the property each morning and was usually completely alone in this particular parking lot at this time. This morning didn't seem any different. I had my hand literally at my keys, my brain in the process to turn off my car, when I noticed a young girl, maybe like 14 or 15 years old, come scampering through the span of the trees that separates the resort from the outside road. She was directly in front of my car, and my headlights illuminated a clear view of her in the pitch black. She looked like she was in high school, had long blonde hair, and was wearing a jacket with pajamas maybe. It was like she just walked out of a house. One thing about her that bothered me was that she wouldn't stop laughing and smiling. I couldn't hear her laughing from outside the car, but she was visually giggling at something I wasn't aware of or could see, and it was so unnatural. She occasionally glanced behind her as if someone else were waiting there away from the headlights. She then waved at me like it were a normal gesture at this time and then immediately ran to my passenger side door. This all happened in a matter of seconds, and I wasn't really sure what was even happening besides my anxiety spiking. I know I simultaneously yanked the aux from my phone to shut whatever song had been playing off while grabbing for the lock button. I remember feeling panic for never remembering if it's up or down to lock when the girl began pulling violently and incessantly on the door handle on the passenger side. I realized because I didn't turn my car off, it had stayed locked. She began pounding on the window, and I was screaming on the top of my lungs for her to leave before pressing on my horn. I could see her laughing outside, like this was some type of game, as if I were a silly friend for not letting her in as a joke. After a few seconds, she stopped pounding and trying to open my car door. Her face fell flat like I disappointed her and she started to walk away from my car, back the way she came. She waved at me again before squeezing through the trees, out of the view of my headlights. This whole encounter confused me almost as much as it scared me. Most people I told the story to just chalked it up to her being on drugs, but that narrative hasn't felt right to me despite her behavior. Maybe she was just being an extremely out-of-touch teenager whose parents need a firmer grip on her. My first thought was possibly human trafficking, but I'm not sure if that would fit the scenario as I'm not the most well-versed with the subject. I told someone when I made it to LP, but they didn't seem to care much. I didn't call the police, and I regret that. I'll never get out of my brain though how fucking off the feeling was watching a stranger, seemingly alone, pop out from the trees in the darkness, laughing, and then try to violently enter your car in an empty parking lot. I do think the possibility of someone else being present the whole time is a lot more scary, and I wonder who else was there, and where exactly.
I hope you enjoyed that, guys. I want to give a special mention to Jay Nightmares for sourcing and translating some of these stories from Japanese. Check out his channel for more stories you haven't heard before. I'll put the link to his channel in the description. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Marciana Rainey, Yolo Sapien, Mary Wright, Jessica Copperfield, Zoe D, Danielle Scholl, Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Callie Townsend, M, Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Love, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Matt is a Felter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel De Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Kuro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.